Yeah, I think it's kind of hard to sample when you're out in the barrel room. If I really want to taste a wine, I have to bring it into a it into. I think it just overwhelms the senses or something. Yeah. There's too much going on. It's really good. There. Yeah. <clears throat> nice, huh? Okay. Well. Welcome everybody to Sender's live broadcast. We are broadcasting out of our tasting room here in Garden City and I have a super special guest with me today. Jake Cragen is the viticulturist for Winemakers LLC. That's the vineyard company that owns Sawtooth and Skyline Vineyards here in Idaho. The two, uh, between the two of them, they're the largest vineyard in the state. And we buy um, a lot of our fruit from them. So Jake and I work really closely together out in the vineyards. We're kind of our, we're counterparts to each other, me on the enology side, him on the viticulture side. So I'm super excited to interview Jake with you guys and um, find out what's going on out at Sawtooth and stuff. So Jake, welcome. Good to be here. <laughs> so if you could start by telling us a little bit about what the heck is a viticulturist, that'd probably be a good, good place to start. Okay, so a uh, viticulturist basically is like your, your quality assurance guy in the vineyard. Um, you know, within, within our company, it's more than that. I mean, I'm a manager, I'm a, I'm a uh, check all the quality of the grapes, I uh, change tires, whatever, you know, just it's everything. But I've definitely seen you driving the trucks full of grapes. Yep. The yep. huge ones. I every once in a while if, if one of our uh, one of our customers needs some help, we uh, I'll pop in the truck and bring some grapes to them if, if they can't get it to their winery. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit of everything, but specifically with the viticulturist, you know, like I said, we're I'm making sure that everything's the water's right, the sprays are right, uh, you know, the canopy's right, everything's ideal so that we can get the best quality product to the winemakers. Mm. So on like a typical summer day, what would you kind of do? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably in the morning go and, and scout the vineyard for any pests. Um, you know, follow up with Aaron, who is our mechanic and spray guy. Uh, make sure like everything's set for a spray or if it's been sprayed, everything's recorded right. Um, then I'll follow up with the crews and see what's going on if we're leafing the canopy or pulling suckers out or, or dropping crop, whatever it is that we need to do for whatever time in the summer it is. Hmm. Okay, so that's cool. Um, so I absolutely love the vineyard that you work on, the Sawtooth Vineyard. So. I want to talk a little bit about that. For one thing, the Syrah that we get off of there, the Sawtooth Block 46 Syrah, is my absolute favorite Snake River Valley block. The Syrah, the, the Syrah is just, it's everything a wine should be. You know, it has great texture, it has wonderful aromas, flavors, and it performs so well. So this last harvest was our 15th harvest for cinder and every one of those 15 years I've loved the wine that's come off that block it's so consistent totally awesome so um, that's my little shout out to just how just let people know how much I love this vineyard so it was super exciting for me when Jake came a few years ago to help out with the effort there and start doing the the viticulture part or you know the guys out there were doing it but as the company and the whole industry here in idaho matures more people are coming with more expertise and so that's been raising really exciting <laughs> what's that raising the roof yeah and um but we met before that in washington so can you just tell us like how did you end up being interested in viticulture and then what was your pathway to to get to where you are uh i wanted to get so I had already had a uh, business degree, and I got to a point where I wanted to do something different. I went back to school because I wanted to get into agriculture. I had somewhat of a background growing up in it, and it wasn't specifically wine grapes. But um, when I was I was at Boise State, uh, Dr. Krista Shelley, who has worked for the USDA, she was a wine grape researcher out in Parma, Idaho. Um, she had funding for a graduate student. So I started as an undergraduate, I went back to school and I started as an undergraduate um, getting a botany degree. 
and I started working with her, and then it rolled into a master's degree. And then eventually my plan was to go to WSU um, to get a PhD. And I worked with some of the folks over there with the, their wine grape research program. I went over there for school um, to, to continue my master's at Boise State with the intent of continuing, and I got accepted into their PhD program. And that summer, I started um, an internship with Winemakers LLC, just waiting for my PhD program to start in the fall. And then I, once I started growing, I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to get a PhD. I'm done with books and classrooms and tests. I'm ready to do this. This is a lot more fun. I want to be a you know, full-time farmer. So am I a cougar or a bronco? I'm a bronco, but I support the cougs. <laughs> this is so funny. It's a good thing we're doing this interview because this whole time I've been thinking that you were a coog. No, I, I, like I said, I spent I spent a semester there as a visiting graduate student, and okay. then I was going to continue on as a PhD student. But it just the way it worked out, I enjoyed farming a lot more than I, you know, than becoming a professor or a research professor. It's just yeah. Well, that's and so yeah, that's kind of how I've worked my way into the farming side of stuff. Yeah, that's super cool. So when we met, you were working for the same company as you are now, yep. Winemakers LLC, but over on, in their Washington vineyards. Yeah, the Winemakers LLC's largest vineyard, which I was talking about earlier uh, to your staff, that the vineyard that I managed in Washington, the single, the single vineyard, encompasses the entire acreage, probably of the entire state of Idaho, in one vineyard. Yeah, so wow. So it's, it's been a bit of a change, but it's a good change. Yeah, and that's, that's Alder Ridge Vineyard, mm -hmm. right, that you're talking about. And this wine that we have in front of us that we're sipping on right now is a wine from Alder Ridge Vineyard because there have been a few years when we've been short enough on grapes here in the Snake River Valley that I've gone to Washington for some of our grapes. And Alder Ridge is uh, one of my first choices that I go to, for one thing, because you know, we, Cinder has a relationship with Winemakers LLC. It's very easy for us to, to work with them. We already have contracts and stuff like that. And so um, in 2019, we purchased a little bit of Barbera that I had had my eye on for a few years and was really interested in making. So just for giggles here, I'm showing Jake the Barbera off of Alder Ridge since it's the vineyard he used to work for or used to work on. And so is that 28? F or 28G? I don't know these things. I'm supposed to remember F versus G. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I remember. Well, yeah, so the block numbers, I think you're a little more familiar with me than, than that, but one of them. Actually, you know what? I think it's a mixture of the two. The two? It was the, the rows that they couldn't sell of both blocks. I just, I got um, a few tons off of it. It's tasting completely delicious. I don't know why it wasn't contracted. It is contracted now, I think. But that's the fun thing about the Cinder Smallout series is if I can see out there in the grape supply world that there's a little bit of a really fun or interesting or high quality fruit, one year, maybe it's one year out of 10 that it's available, I can purchase that and we can make it into a special wine for our wine club. So. That's what this wine is destined to be. We'll release it in springtime as the Smallout series for our club. Uh, a nice 2019 Barbera. So look forward to that. I'm having fun zipping in here. Yeah, I, uh, the last year that I worked at Alder Ridge, I sold you Mavedra, which went into your Smallout series in, is it 18 or 17? Oh uh, yeah, it was, must have been 17 because yeah. that was the the year after Snowmageddon here in Boise when we had to get about 70% of our grapes from Washington. So, yeah, that was a big deal that year. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys kind of saved our bacon by selling us a lot of that fruit. So that was good. Very appreciated. So let's talk about the Sawtooth Vineyard, how it's formed, because I think the geological <coughs> story of the vineyard is so fascinating and surprising to people. I mean, the, the area around here, around Boise, it doesn't seem like terribly dramatic, the valley. Or, but when you drive out to the vineyard area and you drive up to the Sawtooth Vineyard, it's, um, it's hard to see it, but it's an extinct volcano. So it's on a big, long ridge. And I just love this story, story so much that I'm going to take over. And I'm not even going to let Jake tell the story. So it's this big, long ridge. It, we have... Uh, 
there's vineyards all down the south facing side of it some on the north a little bit as well and it was formed when ancient lake idaho existed and ancient lake idaho um besides being the boundaries of our apa it it was this huge lake that covered from almost twin falls to baker oregon eventually it broke out and ran out the hell's canyon and, and carved that deep canyon that that we know of as Hell's Canyon. But while this lake existed, volcanoes were erupting underneath it. And so the Sawtooth Vineyards is an example of this, where the volcano was erupting into the water. And as the lava hit the water, it would shatter and then cool and float down. And so it formed all these little shards of cinder. That's where we got the name for our winery. And it also, you know, the water kind of distributed into this big long ridge. So it's not a big pointy volcano like you would think of as a kind of like what we think of in our mind as a perfect volcano, but it is in fact an extinct volcano, which besides the coolness of that geological story, it does have some effect on the grapes, right? So what what is that like to work on that vineyard with that kind of soil and stuff? It's pretty cool, actually. Um... Just like, like you walk out to the vineyard, and I mean, you, you can just, you, you can see the, the red cinders in, in, the, in the soil. I mean, you know, one of the new blocks we planted, there's just, when we dug into it, just striations of cinder. So kind of what that does is it, it makes the soil, it helps the water drain through the soil so we can really control the, the vines and control quality through, through irrigation. Um, it's not the most, it, it, it's not, how is this? It's not, not the most fertile soil because of the volcanic cinders, which is good for wine growing because it stresses everything and, and creates vines that create unique wines. So why do you want to stress the vines? To, like how, can you compare this to say just growing like another thing that's grown around there a ton is alfalfa. So what sort of different techniques might you use for so, some other uh, crop versus grapes. So you know, like a row crop. I mean, you're 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 trying to grow as much yield as you possibly can. With wine grapes, we're going the other direction. We're reducing the yield. So we'll stress the vines with irrigation um, in soil that's not ideal for most growing or for most crops. And what that does is it makes the plant basically we're artificially creating an environment. I guess you could say. It makes the plant think it's dying so what that does is it causes the plant to force all of its energy into its reproductive growth so into grapes and what that means is then the end product is a higher quality uh, wine grape yeah so if we were doing the opposite say and we were growing grapes and, and you were just letting them like you're watering like a, an alfalfa plant or something I think what's really unintuitive about that is that you might grow so much plant, so much canopy, right, that you wouldn't even get that many grapes. Isn't that right? Right. If you were just, if it just tapped into unlimited amounts of water, let's say, which is practically what it would be like if we watered it like alfalfa or something. Yeah. It would grow so giant that it would be like, ah, I don't need to produce grapes, right? Sure. I mean, it'd have a few, but yeah. and they'd be so shaded, and they, they wouldn't they wouldn't reach maturity, so they wouldn't have a lot of sugar. They wouldn't be super sweet. They'd be very unripe. Mm -hmm. And so, tell us, how do you actually do that with water? Like, the soil isn't holding a bunch of water, but it's holding some. And then, how do you manage that with the irrigation and stuff? Well, I mean, we we have probes in our blocks that met that help measure, help us monitor the amount of water that we put into the soil. So we, we know, you know, how it's working its way through the soil profile, how long it stays, and then um, we do what's called deficit irrigation. So based on how much evapotranspiration, so how much water is being uptake through the plant and dispersed, we, we know how much to put in. And we set a parameter that we know, like if we do it, if we water the plant at like 60% of full capacity, let's say, we know that it's gonna stress the plant to do what we want it to do and it's not gonna get too big, but it'll be enough that it, it still will grow and it'll, it'll ripen fruit. 
Yeah, that's good. That's interesting. So you're um, compared to how much water the plant would take, you give it somewhere around sixty percent of that, yeah. and that keeps it under control in terms of how big it is, and it keeps it just scared enough yep. that it's pushing a lot of energy into grapes and being like, well. I could die this summer, so let's produce some seeds. Let's right. produce some grapes, that kind of thing, right? And it's never, the, the grapes, we never stress it so that it actually dies, but it just, yeah, yeah we create an environment that it thinks that it's, it's, this is it, we're done. We got to do everything we can to make our progeny great so yeah. that birds or whatever come pick the grapes and carry the seeds off. And Yeah, cool. Looks like Kaya has a question for us. They can, yeah. Okay, so do unique soils also provide different nutrients that affect the grapes? Yeah, all soil types, um, all soil types will have different levels of nutrients in them. Um, but I think the, the key takeaway, at least with wine grape growing, is you really don't want really fertile soil you, because you just have excess nutrients and then just run away growth and then you can't control what you're trying to do. Right, like one of the benefits of having really low nutrient soil, I would assume, is that it's impossible basically to take nutrients out of the soil, but it's pretty easy to put nutrients in. So if the f soil starts off low fertility, you can always add a little bit of what you need, mm -hmm. yeah. whether that. So um, do you guys have to add much to your grapes? Uh, we do add. Um, typically, though, it's not anything really major it's like micronutrients the little things that the plants need to uh, improve quality and we do that every year and we monitor it and we you know look at long-term trends if we're adding too much and we start backing off so that we, we maintain an ideal level for, for optimum wine grape quality mm -hmm. so you're you're giving them some vitamins yeah a little bit of vitamins each year and you're actually sampling the plant and looking at well how much vitamins did they take up and store yep. and we, we sample the soil for next and year. the plants wow so it's pretty freaking scientific yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's good what root depth is ideal for wine grape vines does it vary based on the variety um god what root depth I, i've seen everything from like a foot to extremely deep Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, and it's kind of interesting with grapes too. Once you get them going, they're they're almost like weeds. They yeah. just take off. But so a lot of it probably depends on the age of the vine, right? Yeah. If the, if the vine's really old, if you're talking about a twenty or thirty year vineyard, it's going to have had time to dig really deep down, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, just a quick little story. Uh, I used to manage Canoe Ridge in Washington, and we had a, a washout that washed out our road from an irrigation leak. And so, you know, you've got a road that's, I don't know, 20 foot wide, 25 foot wide, and the vines from that, from each side of that block, when we washed out, they had grown and grown and interconnected and kind of went, I mean, that shows you how much they can grow. And th those were old vines, too. Uh-huh. You know, those were at least 20 years old. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. So, but your your vines, they're getting, when you guys are irrigating, they're mostly getting the water right there. Yeah, in a very huh. tight soil profile, yeah. Because you guys are drip irrigating, drip irrigation, so yeah. it's like one drop every second or two hits the ground, and so the grapes kind of get their water from this tight little cluster right under the emitter, right? Yeah, so, so our emitters, um, every emitter emits one third of a gallon per hour. Not very much. Not very much. <laughs> and, you know, it takes probably the course of a week to get through the entire vineyard to water it. Mm -hmm. And this, when when do you guys water typically? I mean, are you watering through the whole season or? No. So depending on the amount of precipitation for that we have in the winter, if it was a really dry winter, we might um, do a little preseason irrigation in uh, November. I mean, I'm sorry, in March. And that's to uh, just kind of bring up the soil profile, make sure the plants have some water for the initial growth. Then we turn it off. We don't water, after March, we don't water until probably, typically with Sawtooth, it's 4th of July weekend. That's the first time we turn it on. 
So you're going some three months or something, mm-hmm. and when everybody else is starting to water their lawns and we're watering other crops and stuff, and grapes don't get anything and then until we, the Fourth of July. When we do it, we don't give them full water. That's when we 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 will give them like sixty percent of what they need. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, so July, August, and September, you're giving them just enough that they don't really shrivel up. Right. But nothing to cause them to grow again. Right. So that's I think that's kind of a mind-blowing concept for a lot of people is the grapes are only getting watered for about three months of the whole season. And the rest of the time, they're just using the soil from the snow and the rain that yeah, falls the, in yep. the winter. Yeah. Yeah. We just, like I said, we'll do preseason just to make sure there's enough so that when they're growing, um, they can get a decent canopy to mature, and then come July, then we just deficit irrigate, so that we just keep them going and milk them along until it's time to pick them. Okay, well, wow, that is so nerdy, and I'm sure that you and I could probably talk about irrigation for hours, but we should move on. So okay. I think we have more questions, but before we see them, um, so just tell us about what, what exciting things are going on with uh, the vineyard out there. I mean, you guys are doing some planting, right? I'm excited about yeah. some of the planting. We've got a lot of projects that we're doing. Um, a couple of projects we're working with you on. Um, so we're on a, I guess, a six-year time frame of doing a replant of a Tempranillo block with two different clones that are going to be much better than the clones than the clone that we have there now. Um, we did a uh, GSM Grenache uh, Mervedra and Syrah block that will be coming into production this year mm-hmm. that we get some of yep and then this this right now what we're doing um, we'll after Christmas break we'll come back and we're gonna do a renewal to the block 46 Syrah and the Tempranillo blocks um, just kind of go cut off dead arms and just clean it up and reestablish it so the Syrah that I love block 46 that I was bragging about earlier um, what do you mean exactly by a renewal it's got like the big structure that's maybe 20 years old. We call it the cordon, right? It's the wood that mm-hmm. you never chop down. Mm-hmm. What will you do for a renewal? So over the years, you lose you lose position. So, so if you think about it on your arm, each position is a spur. Each spur has two clusters on it. Um, we've lost positions. It's an older block, so we've lost spots. So we've, we've lost potential fruit that we could grow. Um, so, so what we'll do is we'll go through and if, if let's say you got a big gap here, but you got a spur here, we'll cut the arm off and then we'll lay that old, uh, the, the, the branch down and that'll become the new arm with new positions. So it's not like when we have winter damage or something, you're not cutting all the way to the ground and regrowing. You're just very selectively kind of working on the areas that don't have as much mm-hmm. production as they should and right. they could. Right. And being an old vine, it has huge root systems, so mm-hmm. it can produce yep. full crop. Like, yeah. There's nothing holding it back, so why not renew some of the cordons and, and get more fruit out of it? Yeah, yeah. We're, our, our, our yields are lower in those blocks, and it's nothing. It's just a, a function of the, the lower yields are just a function of we're missing fruit. You're, yeah, you're yeah. missing. You have some of the branches that just don't have mm-hmm. a shoot growing out of it. Yeah. So, so we're doing that, and then we are also, next year, we're prepping soil to plant a new Petit Verdot block. I'm excited about that as well. Yeah. <laughs> so lots of good things going out there. Mm-hmm. So one of my questions that I had when I pulled the staff earlier was, is there anything you wouldn't want to plant out there? Any varieties? I mean, at, at Sawtooth? Yeah. I'm not sure yet. Um, it... It just, I guess it kind of depends. I, I would be more wanting to know what a winemaker would want to plant, and then I could let them know whether I thought that would work. You know, growing grapes in Idaho, the challenge is things like how hardy the plants are over the winter. So if you have something that's very delicate, then obviously that wouldn't work. But, um, you know, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything that wouldn't be worth trying. Yeah. it's We can grow quite a big, diverse group of grapes yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question for us? Are there insect pests that attack the grapes? And if so, how do you deal with it? Yeah, there are plenty of insect pests. Uh, mealybug, um, leafhopper. Typically what we have to do is we spray. We have to spray um, some of the uh, 
some of the some of the uh, insects we can put in a uh, systemic s systemic um, insecticide through through the drip. Uh, so you know, imidacloprid, which is something that you can buy like at Zamzos, um, that you give to your plants to help grow and fight off insects. We do something like that. Um, to like I said, other other ones we, we spray the canopy with with sprayers, air blast sprayers, cover the whole canopy. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, for if you know people are concerned about the whole pesticide thing, one good thing about grapes is that the customers don't see the flesh and the berry, and so we have a much more tolerant. Um, you know, we, we can be much more tolerant about the look of the grape. Mm -hmm. So don't you think that contributes to just sort of being able to... Um... <laughs> okay, well, we're getting... No one wants to, to talk about bugs. <laughs> okay, we're getting too nerdy, and we're getting orders to do the raffle. So we're doing uh, three weeks of worth of raffle. We've already done the first week. This is the second week. The raffle tickets, all the proceeds, 100%, are going to the Boys and Girls Club, one of our favorite charities. And this week's prize is four bottles of beautiful white wine. We have a, a nice selection here. We've got a flask and two of the, um, what do we call these things? I forget. T tumbler? Tumblers? Yeah. So, since we have a guest, Jake, could you please swirl that around and pick some lucky person. The w winner is Paula Clark. Paula Clark. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so Paula, you can come by the winery anytime and pick that up. Um, and let's see, just a couple of announcements. We're doing the toy drive also for the Boys and Girls Club, but that ends on this coming Monday, the 14th. So if you can make it in this week or this weekend, one toy unwrapped between ages of, well, older than five toy, bring that by for a free glass of wine. And also your window to do your free shipping. If you wanna play Santa is closing next Thursday, the 17th is the last day for that. Just so um, we just appreciate you guys joining us and remember that our tasting room is, is open 11 to six every day. So please come and join us. And thanks, Jake, so much for joining us. Hope you guys like that little bit of major nerdery we just presented to you. So, <laughs> cheers.